Welcome in our co-hosts on this wonderful Friday morning, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. William. It is a wonderful day. The colors are so vivid this time. Very vibrant. It, it, lovely, lovely colors. Wonderful lovely. time to be alive. Wonderful to drive in, except it's so early, getting here for the 502. I, I don't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't see it That's on the way in. That's an inside boat joke, Mike. <laughs> but I do see it on the way back out. It's it's uh, very dark when I get here in the morning. Also, welcome in uh, the Sarge, Michael Height. Good morning, Delegate. Good morning. Great to be here. Good to have you with us. And we'll be joined at uh, 8.35 by the Friday Five, Larry Schultz, Mike Carl, and uh, Joe Freddy by telephone. Before we get to them at 8.35, Tony Petrucci will be phoning in the vote totals. I'm told the early voting totals on the first day Tony phoned in over 2,500, and I think, yeah, yeah and then yesterday over 5,000, I understand it. Yeah. Rob, I voted yesterday. I spent two hours in line waiting to vote, and Mike, it was one of the most enjoyable two hours I've spent in a long time. Everybody's in a great mood. Let me tell you why. Tesla stock was going up like crazy <laughs> while he was standing in line. I, I didn't know that at the time. I, I found that out later. But anyway, everybody's in such a great mood. Everybody was, uh, was part of the voting, saw a lot of old friends. Friends, folks I have not seen for several years. Uh, yeah, a long time in line, but um, well, well worth the time. Yeah, I, I voted as well yesterday, and uh, I spent an hour and a half in line, yeah. uh, not quite as long. Um, I voted in the city. I did too. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it was. It was. I don't know that I would call it enjoyable, but uh, <laughs> well, it, but but people were in a good mood. They were and, in a good and, mood. That's uh, right. Yeah. You know, there weren't weren't a whole lot of. Uh, picketing or or one side or the other or anything like that it just people were there so i want to be here to vote and they were pretty yeah. calm and cool collected i'd be curious to see why so many people have voted this year we're not we're not a swing state uh, maybe it's a carryover from the swing state we have some contested uh races but not as many as we've had in years past you know i, I really don't care i mean i've said on this show plenty of times that, you know i just want you to come out and yes, vote and, and they're that, doing it yeah let's let's get out there and do this so i'm i'm encouraged by this um i wish i had seen this in the primary but i am i'm very encouraged by this and and glad to see people out at the polls yeah 17 percent in the primary i I certainly hope we do far in excess yeah. of that in the in the general. So. Yeah. Our guest in this first segment is Josh Holstein. He is a delegate out of Boone County, and he joins us via telephone. Josh, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. Good morning, sir. Glad, uh, glad to be with you guys this morning. Great to have you. Are you in a contested race yourself, Josh? I am, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, tell us how your race is going to this point. It seems to be going pretty well so far. The folks down here in Boone County, they've had a you know a couple terms here to, to get to know me, and um, we've spent a lot of time out in the community and talking to folks. And you know, there's just a lot of enthusiasm on the ground with the Republican base, and um, you know, they're turning out in droves so far, much more so than the last two elections. Um, so I feel pretty confident about it. Um, my opponent's not really doing a whole lot in terms of campaigning, but. Um, we're marching right ahead, and I think we're we're marching toward a victory. Tell us about yourself a little bit, too, because you're a rather young fella. Yes, sir. So I was first elected in 2020 um, at the age of 19 years old. Um, I became, at the time, one of the youngest members in the country, um, the youngest Republican legislator in the country for two years at the time. So uh, just a little backstory here. Uh, born and raised in Boone County, lived here my entire life. Uh, my dad, my grandparents, all coal miners, um, you know, just a long lineage of Boone County coal miners. And growing up, I saw a dramatic change around, you know, from 2008 to 2010, a dramatic change in life down here. And what I mean by that's not only the economy, but people were leaving in droves. The coal mines were shutting down. Our schools were becoming increasingly more uh, problematic, not even not just in terms of education, but in terms of the physical infrastructure of the buildings. Uh, consolidations were occurring, just a lot of negative things happening. And I was raised in a um, conservative Democrat household. Um, my, both of my parents had pretty much voted straight ticket their entire life. So I was raised as a Democrat. And I... Around this time, uh, late junior high, early high school, I started to really dig in and try to learn as much as I could. And, um, you know, I, I formulated my own opinions and uh, came to my own conclusions about things and, uh, you know, became a 
active in Republican politics as much as I could. I started volunteering and campaigning for uh, Congresswoman Carol Miller, uh, then Congressman Evan Jenkins before that, um, and it just kind of escalated from there. And then in 2020, um, you know, I said, you know, we're going to try this. We've been we've been represented by the same click of folks here for so long and we have nothing to show for it um you know what's it going to hurt to try to try to make a change so it was a long shot bid and we didn't really think we had a chance there um but as the campaign escalated in 2020 we started getting more and more traction and we unseated an incumbent by around nine points and um now we're i'm running for a third term so here we are today are you going to college while you were in the house I did, yes. I graduated college uh, about a year and a half ago. How did yes, sir, you, how, Marshall University. How did you handle both of those, especially during the legislative session? <laughs> it was extremely difficult. Um, a lot of what I was able to do was load up in the fall semester, um, a little extra more than what I would have you know, generally, and then take a couple online summer courses. And um, when I was in high school, I actually got 60 college credit hours, which is the equivalent of two years. Um, my high school here in Boone County offered a program that you could start taking college courses from your second semester of your sophomore year, um, and I took advantage of that too. Um, and I'm glad I did because that would have, you know, prohibited me some. But um, that that was able to give me a, a huge leg up to basically start in person on year three. Josh, in the Eastern Panhandle, we don't see a lot of coal miners, nor do we right. deal much with the coal industry. How important is coal in your end of the state in terms of what it used to be, what it maybe could be still, and what it means to everyday life? It's the end-all, be-all. And I know that's a cliche, but people, people don't quite understand how deeply intertwined the, uh, the coal industry is with everything in southern West Virginia. It's not just a oh, well, this is the, where the majority of the jobs come from. No, this is where so much of the tax revenue comes from, which affects your, your infrastructure, which affects your schools. Um, you know, when the, when the coal jobs started declining, as I said earlier, the population really started to, to plummet. Um, you know, we've lost about, since 2010, we've lost about 10,000 people in Boone County, almost a third of our people. And, you know, it's mostly young folks. It's, you know middle-aged folks who are still working that, that have to find a place of employment. And one of the failures here in, 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 in the past for, for not only Boone County, but Southern West Virginia is our local elected officials just rode the coal wave when it was at its highest and never looked for anything to diversify. And I'm not talking diversification of energy, but I mean di diversification of the economy. I guess everybody just presumed that we wouldn't have – you know, a federal smackdown or a nationwide change on, you know, fossil fuel policy. And so there wasn't much, there wasn't much of an investment or a foresight in making those changes. And now we're really struggling from that and it's going to take years to recover. Um, but that's pretty much where we are now. That's interesting. I'm just drawing similarities to my youth as a kid in Pittsburgh when the mills began to close. And when the, when the mill closes, it's not just the mill job you lose. It, it's the little shop beside the mill where people went to the diner. It's the clothing store. It's everything, the small business that surrounds these places where people spend their money. And those places close up too or have to reduce hours. It's a lot. There's the fallout is huge. I, I understand from Delegate Hornby that uh, you've done some interesting research on this upcoming election. Yes, sir. Um, so I've been really watching the, um, the early vote and the absentee by mail voting totals and and particularly the swing states but really across the country too um there's a there's a tracker for some of your listeners that that may be interested in checking this out nbc news has a early voting tracker and they have a nationwide map and uh you can hover over each of the states and see the exact number of people who have cast their ballots so far um and they break it down by age gender um and also how they voted whether it was in person or by mail, and then they also break it down by party registration. So some of the things we're seeing um, in the swing states in particular are really drastically different from 2020 
and uh, also pretty different from 2022 um, in favor of Republicans across the country. Um, to my knowledge and to my research so far, there's not a there's not a single one of the seven swing states where Republicans are doing worse than they were in 2020 or in 2022 in absentee and early voting totals. Um, in fact, if you look at um, and this isn't really a swing state, but if you look at the state of Florida now, you know President Obama won Florida twice, and then President Trump won it twice uh, narrowly the first time, and with around a three and a half point lead the second time. Um, if you look at the breakdown right now, Republicans are actually leading in early and mail ballots by 9% statewide with over 3.5 million votes cast. I mean, that, that's remarkable. That's never happened before. That's, uh, you know, a structural advantage of the Democrat Party is a lot of their base and a lot of their registered voters are um, concentrated in urban population centers, um, you know, in cities. Um, and uh, large suburb areas. So it's much easier if you're if you're running a um, a mail ballot campaign. You know, it's a lot easier to get 500 votes from a block than it is in, for Republicans, where their base is scattered out throughout most of the rural parts of the country. So it's a much easier um, task there for the Democrat Party to um, ballot harvest where it's legal and to promote. Um, uh, mail-in ballots where ballot harvesting isn't allowed. So it's it's very remarkable, and I think what I've taken from this so far is I think it's indicative more of enthusiasm than it is uh, anything else. Uh, but one thing I will say, like in the state of Nevada, um, Republicans have never been ahead in early and mail ballots uh, together, never since uh, at least pre-2000 in a presidential election. Um, and now they're leading by around four and a half percent. And some of the, some of the, um, the pushback that I've heard from, from some folks is, well, this is just Republicans getting out early because the Republican party has really been pushing that. And it just means that less of the Republicans are going to be showing out. There will be less Republicans to turn out on election day. Well, that could be true. And it may be true in some states. However, if you look at states like Nevada, um, a great portion of those, a much higher percentage than, than Democrats, are coming from new voters and voters who haven't vote, have been registered but haven't voted in the last two or three elections. They're turning out at a much higher rate on the Republican side than they are the Democrat side. And what that leads into is by Election Day, Republicans have built up an advantage statewide, and they still have all of their very likely and certain voters that will turn out on Election Day. Whereas the Democrats have in that state have turned out more of their certain and likely voters and have to rely on folks who have never voted or new registrants to turn out on Election Day to beat the advantage. So we're seeing things like that, and particularly in Nevada and Arizona, it seems like those two states are really, really pretty much almost certainly going to go to the Republican. I would be shocked. There would have to be a dramatic um change in the history of election day turnout and uh, what i mean by that is republicans usually turn out um at a, at a much higher percentage on election day um, and that would have to tr change dramatically to cut into the advantages in, in those two states and uh you know in the rust belt a couple states where they do not uh, in particular wisconsin where they do not um register voters by party the only real indication on how the results are playing out there that you can that you can really look into is turnout by counties. So is this a county that uh, President Biden won by a large margin, or is this a county that President Trump won by a large margin? Um, and you can kind of extrapolate data from that. Um, but what we're seeing there, too, as well, is there's uh, an overall decrease in turnout from 2020 in, in Wisconsin fairly substantially. But the, the decrease in turnout is much higher in Democrat counties than in Republican counties. And that also leads you to think, of course, you don't know how the voters are, are voting or if there's been a shift in thought, but that's just extrapolating the information from previous elections. But it does, it does appear that in most of the swing states, there is a early on advantage um, for the Republican Party. And nationwide, and I'll finish up with this, 
there's been 31, uh, 31,715,000 mail-in and early ballots cast. Um, and that partisan breakdown uh, nationwide, this is put together by Target Smart, which is a, a Democrat um, uh, national political firm. Um, and they model people's – in states where there's no political party affiliation, they just register to vote, they model their – um, their party affiliation. So out of that 31,715,000, they estimate that 39% are Republicans, 43% are Democrats, 18% are um, unaffiliated or other. And that would be, you know, a dramatic tightening of where it was either in 2022 or 2020 at this point in time. Good information, Josh. Bill? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Josh, for that. I've been tracking as well. Uh, a state you did not mention is Pennsylvania, and right now the yes. uh, the Republicans are uh, uh, trailing the Democrats' uh, early voting. Far as for fair large number, substantial number, uh, and but there's you're exactly right. The trend is that there's more Republicans voting early voting this year than they did in twenty. 2020. But my impression was that was because there was a push uh, by the uh, uh, by Trump and uh, to get out and vote early, whereas last time he was taking just the opposite position. Do not go out and vote early. Vote on Election Day. And lesson was learned. So uh, you may well be right. That's going to so uh, suggest it's going to be a kind of a you do not use the term landslide, but a lot of states going Republican because it's early voting. But I'm not sure that I would jump to that conclusion just yet. Yeah, I don't. Sure. I, actually, I, I do. Um, I, I think this is uh, all of this uh, analytical uh, uh, information uh, points toward a, a Republican win. Um, because, as Josh said, Republicans. Uh, historically have not come out early um, and have not done the mail-in ballots um, they they tend to show up on election day I think the the most important uh, data that that uh, you mentioned Josh was the fact that uh, new voters or unlikely voters are many of the ones that are showing up early um, and to me, that is a telling tale because those those people um, obviously weren't going to come on Election Day either. So if those people are motivated to come out and vote, um, I think that that points to a, a huge win for uh, Donald Trump and the Republicans. And especially and I've said this before as well in those swing states, um, those are the ones uh, electorally that are going to decide this race one way or the other. Um, it, it's not going to be a, a state like West Virginia that we know is going to go deep red. It's going to be that, that Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia um, that are going to make these decisions. And, and early voting in those states is, uh, is very indicative of, of positive for Republicans. You mentioned age, though, the younger one. Pennsylvania, 55 percent of the folks that have voted early, 65 years of age or older. In Arizona, 55 percent of 65 years and older. Now, Georgia, a little bit younger, a little bit smaller percent. Uh, but in uh, Wisconsin, another critical state, 50 percent are 65 years and older. Josh, do you have any other uh, detailed information regarding early voting on this election you didn't get to? Yeah, just a couple of things that were mentioned there um, that I'd like to I'd like to yeah, uh, please. go on with there for a few minutes. Uh, the gentleman mentioned Pennsylvania there earlier. He's exactly right. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania, 61 percent to 30 percent Democrats to Republicans. But here's what was left out of that argument is at this point in time, it was about 13 in, in 2020. It was about 13 percent more Democratic, meaning that it was it was like 68 to 28 or excuse me, 68 to 26 at this point in time. Um, very, very def, uh important distinction there is that while Democrats still have a large advantage as they again as I've argued the entire time they they should it's a structural advantage they have forever um, the the margin in Pennsylvania has dramatically decreased um, 
still a 30 point advantage, but it's dramatically uh, tightened. And um, I, I will agree with that. Now, um, when it comes to age, I, I expect that a lot of young voters will still, you know, I don't think President Trump will win a lot of young voters. Um, he probably 40, 45 percent under, under, you know, uh, the age of 30. But, you know, when you talk about previous election history, where that number was in the low 30s or the mid 30s, um, if you bump that up to 40, that's a dramatic difference in the electorate. And then the last thing I would say is um, I agree also to the gentleman that said um, there's a push now for Republicans to turn out. Absolutely there is. That's been the uh, the number one priority of the RNC and of the Trump campaign is to turn Republicans out. But again, I would – I would suggest that there's a there's a structure there's an advantage here, um, not just in terms of people who like myself who vote every single election that are turning out, um, but you've got to look at the data and see well who's actually turning out, and are Republicans turning out their new voters and their infrequent voters at a higher rate than the Democrats are, and in most of the swing states the answer to that is yes, and in tight elections you know. Where, who would you rather be? Would be this. This would be my my question here. Who would you rather be? Would you rather be the the group that turns out their their base and their certain folks early and have to depend on infrequent voters and brand new voters with no voter history on election day, or would you rather be the individuals who have a larger number of infrequent voters and new registrants that have voted early? They're in the bank. They're locked in. And then on election day, uh, rely on your frequent and certain voters. I think that's been the strategy of the Republican Party the entire time, and it may prove uh, to be, you know, not enough. I, I don't know, but it, it certainly appears to be, um, you know, turning out in a, in a much better light than it has in the last previous election. And I, I'm not suggesting that this election is going to be a landslide. I do think it'll be relatively close. But I, I do think also that this is uh, indicative of Republican enthusiasm more than anything. Yeah. Well, the way the system's set up, you could lose the popular vote and win an electoral landslide. Yes. That's right. Depending on how you define landslide. That's just kind of the way the system is set up. Josh. Absolutely. Good stuff, man. Best of luck to you in your uh, upcoming Thank race you. yourself, too. We appreciate the information this morning. Great job. Yes, sir. Thank you. Have a good day. You, too. Thanks. Josh Holstein, delegate out of the 32nd in uh, Boone County, as he said. Uh, for two years, he was the youngest elected Republican legislator in the country. Elected at the age of 19. I've got